Last week's jobs numbers show a slight increase in hiring. Most of those jobs are not full-time gigs. New numbers from the Labor Department tell the story of the 980,000 new jobs added to the economy this year. 70% of those were part-time work. Part-time America is this the way we're Welcome to Age of the Obsolete, the weekly podcast that examines the intersection of technology, democracy, and the future of work. I'm your host, John Rovito. Obsolescence is defined as the process of becoming outdated or no longer useful. When we think of being obsolete, what we think of is old technology, rusted machinery, cars that no longer run, things. But is it possible for people to also become obsolete? For the, pa- for the past 150 years, the American dream has meant that each generation would rise both socially and economically beyond the one that preceded it. From the stories of Horatio Alger to the waves of immigrants entering Ellis Island, America has always been seen as the land of opportunity, a fertile ground where hard work and determination would be rewarded by continued financial success. Traditionally, when we talked about the future, what we talked about was owning a new home, sending our kids to college, retirement and financial security. Unfortunately, is in danger of dying. Since 1975, the income gap has steadily widened to where today, the top 1% command the lion's share of wealth in the United States. As economist Paul Krugman tells us, this is a trend driven not by the greed of the nouveau riche, but by the power of inherited wealth This is not, the world is not the way I saw it. The world, in fact, has moved on a long way in the last 25 years and not in a direction you're going to like because we are seeing not only great disparities in income and wealth, but we're seeing them get entrenched. We're seeing them, we're seeing them get entrenched. We're seeing them become uh, inequalities that will be transferred across the generations. Uh, we are becoming very much the kind of society we imagine we're nothing like. What that means is that if you have a large fortune, Suppose that our family has a large fortune. They can, the inheritors of that large fortune, can live very, very well. They can live extraordinary scenario of living and still put a large fraction of that of the income from that fortune aside, and the fortune will grow faster than the economy. So the big dynastic fortunes tend to take an ever-growing share of total national wealth. When you have what Teddy Roosevelt could have told you and did, that when you have a few people who are so wealthy that they can effectively buy the political system, the political system is going to tend to serve their interests. And, and that is going to reinforce this shift of income and wealth towards the top. Financial crisis of 2008, the 9 million net new jobs created in the U.S. have been in the area of freelance, part-time, or contract services a gig economy without benefits or security. Over the next two decades, it's estimated that the confluence of artificial intelligence, automation, e-commerce, and outsourcing may result in the elimination of up to 47% of the jobs that exist in the U.S. today. According to Andrew McAfee of MIT's Sloan School of Management, these are not simply low-wage, low-skilled jobs, but also white-collar positions in the financial, legal, and healthcare professions. The median American worker doesn't do manual labor anymore. The average American worker is not a ditch digger, but they're also not doing incredibly high-end particle physics or data science. They are what you'd call a somewhat routine, routine knowledge worker. That is right in the sweet spot of where technology is making its greatest inroads. And a good example of that is a tax preparer. That's someone who has mastered a very complicated American tax code, but they do the same thing over and over. They apply that code to an individual person. That's that's recently become fairly easy to automate and automate very well. So now a lot of us find a $40 program like TurboTax 
completely adequate for our needs. That's great news for two out of three constituencies. The constituency that's most negatively affected is the body of tax preparers, folk who are actually above average educated. They've been to college, they've been to an advanced degree, they've got a CPA, they've done the right thing. They've invested their human capital in an area they thought would lead to a long and productive career, and all of a sudden here comes a $40 piece of software that's putting a lot of downward pressure on their wages. And, and the, the law has been another pretty high prestige, well-paid, highly educated profession. There is a lot of pressure in the legal industry these days. Law school applications, not per capita, but raw law school applications, are at their lowest level since the 1970s. So a lot of these, these trends are putting pressure, not just on that classic median American worker, but even on fairly highly educated, well-paid ones like law. Previously, the process known as structural unemployment meant that the technological destruction of jobs would be by the creation of new jobs that would take their place. While it's true that emerging technologies will create new and often challenging work, most economists agree that these jobs will be far fewer and require far less people. At its worst, the Great Depression of the 1930s displaced approximately 25% of the American workforce. If only part of the current estimates hold true, the coming disruption can have catastrophic consequences, not only economically, but also socially, psychologically, and politically. That's why policymakers around the workers around the world have begun to look for ways to offset the damages caused by technological unemployment. In addition to the re-education and upskilling of those who have been displaced, a key part of the discussion is the concept of a universal basic income, a guaranteed paycheck to serve as qualities of what's become known as the Fourth Industrial Revolution, inequalities highlighted during a discussion at the 2017 World Economic Forum. But it's not all good news, and, and the other reason people are talking about it is not because of these wondrous technological developments, but it's because of the political backlash that we've seen because many people are not participating in this revolution. The reality is that there's no economic law that says that uh, everyone's going to benefit from a technological advance. It's possible for some people even a majority of people to be left behind. Through most of history, that's not what happened. But in the past revolution, especially the past 10, 20 years, there have been so many people left behind. The shocking statistics are that the median income, the person in the fifth percentile in the United States and other countries is lower now than it was uh, uh, 15 years ago. And furthermore, uh, over 80%, according to a recent McKinsey study, over 80% of households have not seen any real income gains. Whether or not UBI will work remains controversial and open to debate. Still, it's a debate worth having, one driven by the possibility that in the near future, a significant portion of the U.S. population may become economically obsolete delete. Join me each week as I explore the different forces impacting democracy and the future of work. From technologies such as automation, artificial intelligence, and genetic engineering, to issues that include populism, immigration, income inequality, and more. And personal and career strategies that can protect you from falling by the wayside and joining the ranks of the obsolete because the best way to predict the future is to create it. This is John Revito saying, thanks for tuning in. If you have any questions or if you have any questions or want additional information on any of the topics covered in these podcasts, please go to our website at ageoftheobsolete.com. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.